Right. Um, my name's Luke from uh, the imaginatively titled Luke Hall Studio. Um, it's a group of uh, animators, designers, and technologists um, that all work under the banner of, of, of my name. Um, we chose that route because we find that clients often want a singular vision of, um, of how a design should be or, or of how content should, should flow. Um, and I've found that historically when I've had um, studios that have, have different names, that you get treated in a very, very different way. And it's mostly about having ownership over the work. So uh, that's why we're, we uh, exist under my name. Um, one thing I'd like to point out to start with, whenever I say I, it's always a we. You know, there's, the, you know, there's a massive team that work underneath me. Um, so there's always a we, and some of those we are people in this room as well. So if I miss you out, I'm sorry, but there we go. So um, a bit of a background on me. By the way, I found an amazing website that, with some geek who collected all of the After Effects icons going back to Kosa. Um, so uh, I was a kid who discovered Photoshop on the front of Computer Arts magazine uh, when I was like 12 or 13. Um, which just uh, started this absolute love affair with, uh, love affair with computer graphics. Um, I moved to London, gave up all my qualifications, and I started actually as an avid engineer at Post House in Soho when I was 17. Um, I was really lucky to sort of really hit my career at the start of digital video and desktop, uh, video on personal computers. And so uh, I became, within a couple of years, a freelance After Effects animator. And at the time, there was about 10 of us. And I was going around Soho doing uh, client-attended onlines with like Media 100 and After Effects, which was absolutely mental. Um, and sort of stealing jobs off of flaming inferno artists. Um, but that at least, you know, that taught me to be quite quick at you know, creating stuff, or certainly quick at hiding when I was rendering. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to work with some really talented people. You know, and as I said, just why riding that wave of digital video and, and the rise of nonlinear editing. But I always had, a, had an interest in live, um, and I always wanted to get back into uh, being involved in theater and shows. Um, and I got really bored of animation, and I didn't want to do another Logo Resolve ever again after a few years. Um, and I ended up um, going out and VJing for a couple of, couple of DJs on world tours. And through that, I ended up meeting with Willie Williams, who got me on U2 tour, uh, which was the Vertigo Outdoor, which had led on from where Chris and the guys were talking about yesterday. Um, and then through a few stints at uh, 1.0, and then treatment, and then opening my own studio. That's basically where, where, how I got to where I am now. Um, I suppose <laughs> I'm here to represent uh, the sort of non-real-time scene. You know, the, um, the sad, lonely nights of watching render bars and copying hideously large files. Um, I mean, Chris mentioned yesterday in his speech that you, you, know, you don't see many of us around on shows anymore, but there's still plenty of us around. Um, we're still there in the background churning out pixels, and I'm a fan of a slower process. Although within our studio, we do do some real-time work. I think there's a lot of room still for uh, not being able to do what the client says immediately. I think that's actually quite a good option sometimes. Quicker isn't always better. Um, so I'll just take you through some of the uh, shows that I'm sure some of you will recognize and worked on. Um, and then I'll just talk about one show very specifically. So as I said, my work spanned over 25 years. Uh, we've been lucky enough to work on, uh, we still do quite, quite a lot of quite intimate theater work. We do a lot of opera, do a lot of ballet, um, fashion, big touring music things, like just the whole gamut. And we really try and um, that, that work feed into the, the other work. They, you know, it all has a language that can talk to each other. And you can take you know, skills and things you learn on a massive multi-million dollar show and do it on a tiny theatre show in, a, in you know, a tiny theatre in London. They all have something to say to each other. If you, if you can create a career which holds all of this stuff in balance, and financially they hold each other in balance, um, then I think you, you, your work gets richer because of it. 
Um, so we, you know, we do shows from audience sizes of 300 up to, I think, million was the, uh, was the biggest show that we did. Um, so we've, you know, we've worked in Bregans on the lake stage, that's our Carmen that we did a few years back, through to shows for the XX, uh, or Adele, that was a while back, that was a bit of a nightmare show. Um, <laughs> There's a few of those. Uh, Dua Lipa and, you know, big projection works for, this is a, a Beatles show, or the show we just finished this year, finally, after three years of COVID, uh, the um, Pet Shop Boys show, which has gone out, which is a show I'm really, really proud of if you get a chance to see it. It's really good. Um, through to sort of larger UE National Day shows, uh, or even the 2012 closing. Um, and also, uh, I was kind of lucky enough to, you know, work on some of the biggest rock and roll tours that, you know, have been out there, and that was at the start of my career, and I've just been getting smaller and smaller ever since, it feels like. Um, but one of the things with the smaller shows I've found is you just have more ownership. So one of the things I've loved about working in theatre and opera is that actually once the show is over, you actually get reviewed. You know, you get reviewed in the national press and people will just pull up your name and tell you if you're shit or not, really. Um, we've had some really, you know, horrific, horrific reviews, but there's something really nice about that level of ownership. And also the idea of, uh, you know, on an opera, on opening night, you actually go up on stage and take a bow, you know, along with uh, everyone on stage. And there's something really, really beautiful about that. And I think that's something... Um, that gets lost, I think, in certain parts of our industry, actually, how much ownership we should have over our work and over our designs. Um, this is an opera we did in LA a few years ago, this giant sort of suspended ball in the um, Walt Disney Hall. Uh, or so it's a Pan American Games in Peru a few years back. Or Paul Game Bass at the Met in New York. Another Pet Shop Boys show. This is another Bregans that we just did, Madame Butterfly, this summer. So again, you know, just a giant projection screen the size of a football field. Um, and now this is, this is our frameless gallery that's just opened in Marble Arch. If you get a chance to see it, you really should pop down. Um, it's uh, for um, uh, art-based interactive rooms. Uh, that's uh, the first sort of permanent art projection gallery in London. Um, and that opened a couple of weeks ago, so that's been keeping us quite busy. Um, yeah. Right, so I'm here to talk about designing for an audience and actually how does having an audience impact your design process? And what are the things that we have to what, what are the tools that we have in order to communicate with an audience? Also, this is, this is one of the most depressing photos I could find. I can't remember which theatre this was, but this was their attempt at COVID isolation. Yeah. Anyway, that was a bad time. Let's forget about it. Um, so how does an audience impact the design process? Um, and why do people go to shows? And why do we want to... You know, why are we so obsessed by, you know, giving up our lives and traveling around the world to, you know, build these things? And ultimately, it's, it's about, I think it's about connecting with those audience members. Um, so everyone that want, comes to a show, they want to connect with someone who's on stage. It's a human connection. So uh, whether it's an actor in a tiny little theater or whether it's an artist, you know, um, playing to an entire stadium, our job as designers is to enhance that connection um, and to not get in the way. Um, and there's different ways that you can do that. Um, and what are, what are the tools available to us? Ultimately, one of the biggest things is about um, taking people's expectations and playing with their expectations. So whether it's a, uh, someone's turning up to a gig for an artist that they've known for years, they have a real idea of what that show should look like or how that music should be interpreted. And you need, you need to be able to use that to your advantage 
as a designer. So whether you're going to play on that, whether you're going to give them what they want, or whether you're going to give them something totally different. Um, so it's about expectation. Play, playing with the audience's expectations, I think, is really, really important. You know, what is the thing they're built up in their heads for years about their favorite artist? And how are you going to play into that? You know, and how are you going to play against that? And how are you going to find a new language to interpret that work? Obviously, that's going to be different for an opera than it is for a concert. But ultimately, it's still all about music. So the expectations that an opera audience are going to come with is going to be very, very different. And that they're, they're a really tough audience to please. They, they sort of don't really like anything. They, they, they like things to be very traditional. But when they say traditional, they don't mean in 1886 when the piece was written. They mean in 1976 when they first saw it, which is crazy. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is a subject I can talk about for a really long time. Um, you know, how to connect with an audience and how to not get in the way. But I just want to take two examples and then talk about one project which sort of confounds both of those examples. So in a, how does this differ, this, this concept? How does it differ with different audience sizes? Ultimately, in a small scale theater, you have a few bodies on stage and a really small audience. Often no mics, you know, you need complete silence in order to maintain that connection between a um, audience member and the storyteller on stage, the, uh, the actor. Any design element added to this really needs to fit into two categories. Either it's scenic, so it's a substitute for an environment, or it gives a signifier to the audience of location, time, place. Um, or it's psychological. It's a magnification of a performer's internal world. And you can apply that to lots of different genres, um, as well as theater. You can, even, you can apply that to you know, rock shows, anything. It's either, it's either scenic, about place, time, environment, or psychological. Um, both of these modes draw the audience in, and they contextualize the story for the performer. And that's, that's really important. That's ultimately what we're doing when we're designing shows. We're contextualizing the, the performance, whether that's a, a script, piece of music, um, or you know, a piece of dance, or whatever. It's, it's about you know, making, enhancing that world. Um, but ultimately, I think what this is all about is encouraging intimacy between what's going on on stage and an audience member. Then you take that and apply that to large scale. You know, you've got huge distances to the stage to deal with. You've got, um, you're interpreting the music. You know, you're creating a visual representation of the inner world of that artist. Um, you're adding to the interpretation of the music and you're adding scale. Um, and obviously a lot, of, you know, most gigs now will rely on iMag. And it's funny if you do, if you applied iMag or the concept of iMag or of using cameras in a small show, it would totally get in the way of that connection with, with the audience. Whereas actually at this scale, it absolutely enhances that connection. It gives you back that intimacy. Um, so uh, in 2019, I was asked to, by a director called Eva van Hove, to reimagine West Side Story on Broadway, um, which was no small feat. It's a very well-loved story, very well-loved musicals, and I don't really like musicals. Um, I also, one other thing I really hate is um, cameras in theater. Uh, and I just thought, you know what? If we're gonna try and do this, if we're gonna try and mesh these two worlds, this is, this is the time to do it. So, uh, we were due to open in early 2020, which we did, briefly. Um, but we created something that was quite, quite interesting, I think. And the reason I want to talk about it today is because not enough people got to see it. Um, we stripped out the Broadway Theatre um, on Broadway in New York. 
uh, which is a ginormous, cavernous theatre. We took out every bit of wing space, every sort of theatrical device, and we filled the entire back wall with a giant LED screen. Um, then around the theatre, so not only on stage and the auditorium, but some of the stairwells, you know, we, we placed 36 cameras um, that were all remote control and that could all be called upon at, at any moment to tell this story. And ultimately, what we were trying to do is use... So cameras and pre-shot footage were the only things that we had available to us for, to tell this story. But what it did is it, it both swamped what was going on stage and enhanced it at different levels. So sometimes we used it as a, as a device to actually get in the way of this sort of human connection and also magnify the sort of battle between these two groups, these two groups of kids, these two gangs. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot of... Oh, sorry. Where are we? Yeah, so there, you know, whether it's the, the dance sequences or, um, you know, some of the love scenes, everything had this sort of IMAG feel to it. Um, and uh, one thing it didn't feel like was your regular musical. I think that was what was so sort of fascinating about, that, about this particular piece. Um, we also had the ability, which was absolutely crazy, to shoot all of these nighttime sequences all around New York. So we actually ended up shooting for 35 days, which is longer than most feature films, with a full feature film crew. Uh, we had 10 nights of clearing six blocks of New York of all cars, with full wet downs and a whole lot um, to shoot these um, sort of scenic backdrops. And really what we were trying to do is create this sort of slow motion film that uh, these dancers existed within. So it's this constantly moving slow motion backdrop all the way through. Um, so it was never scenic, it never sort of stopped. It wasn't in replacement of scenery. It was an addition. It was trying to, you know, almost like place them in this movie. Um, and because this, the screen was so large at the back, you know, we were carefully matched all our perspectives all the way through, so it always felt like they were almost like dancing within it. And then we also shot it with a lot of the dancers in the distance as well, all doing these sort of slow motion choreography. Um, as well as all that, we then had these doors that opened up to reveal these photorealistic sets that you couldn't even see. So you could just see the entrance to them and they went off the back into the back of the theatre. Um, and all of those things were full of cameras as well. And it, it meant that literally you'd, just have, you'd have two people having a conversation, walking into these sets, the doors would close and then you'd be watching the movie. Um, and there was this beautiful sort of interaction between you know, something happening live on stage and also something that you knew was happening live backstage as well. And we were just, we were just cutting the cameras around it. But it was all, it was all very, very carefully programmed and choreographed. Um, so it was really just playing with the audience's idea of uh, what was a film, what was real. And it gave it a level of connection and emotion, um, uh, as I was saying earlier, between the audience members and you know, and these, these actors. You could get these beautiful close-ups. Um, the other part of this production is the entire um, second half of it. So the entire second act, it rained consistently on stage. Like, absolutely pissed it down, which caused all sorts of... Um, problems, but it was this wonderfully evocative sort of feeling of being, um, you know, like trapped outdoors in New York when it's raining. And that's where all of the fights happened. These kids just getting absolutely soaked. We were getting through 200 grand's worth of radio mics every week. <laughs> it was 
absolutely nuts. There was a, there was a point at the end where uh, the two leads actually had six radio mics on their face. Looked like Bane. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I admire the sort of the producer's sort of willingness to keep going with this stuff. But, just, you know, having your two leads like singing one of the greatest musical songs of all time in the pissing rain is a, is a real, um, it's a, it was a real thing to, to behold. Um, it's just some sort of behind the scenes. These are the, the yokes that we had all the cameras on, so they're all completely programmable. Um, is this playing? So these are some of the sort of slow-mo sequences that we were shooting. Um, yeah, I've never had sort of budgets quite like this to play with before and probably never will again. Um, so, you know, any time I get to sort of show this to people, I'm always, uh, always happy to. Um, and these are, you know, these are some of the, the dream sequences that we were shooting. Um, in uh, some parts of New York, which I never ever want to go back to ever again, to be honest. We were, we were going into parts of New York where even the police wouldn't come in with us. Um, and then we had to go in and, you know, had these vans just picking up everyone's cars and moving them out of the way. It was absolute chaos. And then this is an example of um, some of the sort of major sequences and you'll see just how much detail was going on. Each one of these was fully scripted and also played into people's movement around the stage. So it was this, it was this weird thing of being a content designer, but also being half director of the show. Like it was this, and I'm finding this more and more as I get further on in my career, that actually we're not just doing content design anymore. You know, we are absolutely integral to the way a show is conceived and worked out. And I think that's, that's one thing that I've noticed that's been really interesting. Certainly when I first started, um, there wasn't even the role of a video director on tours. They just didn't exist. Um, and so it was always, I was just the content guy. And then the light designer would deal with it all, you know. The light designer was the one that was speaking to the band and he was the one that was sort of saying, oh, we, you know, this is, this is how the show should flow. And that always struck me as really odd uh, and that's why I sort of moved away from the sort of rock and roll world, the touring world, and went into theatre because there was much more of a tradition of there being a video or a projection designer in theatre. Um, and now it's sort of, I feel like it's come full circle, whereas there is much more of an idea of having a video designer or a video director on a tour. Well, video director is a different thing, but... Um, or, and content people have much more of a voice within how, is, how a show is, is crafted, I suppose. And that's been really lovely to watch. And the, you know, just to see the, you know, the amount of sort of content studios that are out there and the amount of amazing shows that are being made, um, uh, it, it's, it's really wonderful to see. But I would encourage um, you know, any content studios or anyone that uh, feels like they, they have an idea of the sort of stagecraft of how they want a show to go, to have a look at you know other forms you know like there's only so much uh, you know piecemeal content you can make. I think shows need much more of a sort of arc to them, um, and I'd encourage people to sort of get into the a bit more theatre and a bit more um, opera and a bit more dance because there's although the budgets are really bad they you know they, the the um, the, the freedom and the sense of uh, creative ownership within them, I think, is is huge, you know, and it's it's really really rewarding. Um, so anyway, with West Side Story, we did seventy previews. So uh, obviously, you do your previews until you actually open. We opened, and then two weeks later, um, COVID happened and all got shut down and the show will never be seen again. Um, and uh, partly because, you know, two years later with a recast, 
having to you know, spend another 2.5 million shooting all of that stuff again. I don't think the producers were that interested. Um, but it's, it's a real shame, but it's one of those shows that I'm not sure whether it was a successful adaptation of the musical, but I'm very glad it existed. And I'm glad someone was willing to, um, uh, you know, put, put the money behind it. Um, yeah, and it, yeah, it was, it, was, it was wonderful to be involved in. It really was. And whether it was successful or not, I just pulled out a couple of, um, couple of the reviews. Um, perhaps it's exactly the visual hustle and bustle that might polarize audiences with massive video images sometimes flashing close-ups of the on-stage action, sometimes taking a Busby Berkeley bird's eye view perspective, and still other times displaying pre-taped visions of near-empty city streets at night, the occasional glimpse of silhouetted dancers in the distance. There's a simple answer to anyone wondering where to look, everywhere. Um, and it's really rewarding to you know, read these kind of, you know, read the audience's responses to your work. Um, and this is the kind of feedback that you just, you don't really get in um, any other, any other realm. Um, yeah, and so, some of the reviews were definitely not that kind, but um, you know what, I, you know, it's just nice to try something different. Um, anyway, that's what I wanted to share with you today. Um, so is there questions or? Yeah. Take some questions. Great. Thank you. We got mics out. Hi, Luke. Hi. Um, so I was just curious because it's timely. That's in the news today. I don't know if you saw it, but the NPO has been released to the Arts Council, and apparently quite a lot of money has been taken out of. The UK, sorry, the London theatre scene, particularly mm. the opera houses, um, and the English National Opera might have to move out of London altogether because of it. So yeah. I'm just curious. We talked about budgets quite a lot and how you know money's an, you know, an issue a lot of the time with theatre productions. And I'm certainly finding that you know theatre companies just never have enough money to pay for the content that they really desire and they they, they envision. No. What do you think is going to happen? In the I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's certainly talking about the Arts Council. It's um, it's a real shame because. You know, you basically look at the Second World War and the Arts Council and the NHS, the two things that really came out of that. Um, and it's a real shame to watch that be completely dismantled. Um, because I think it's really important um, for us to invest in our, certainly in the UK, in our sort of cultural heritage. And also, to be honest with you, a lot, you know, a lot of theatre productions that um, we are able to or we have historically been able to nurture here have then gone on to make a huge amount of money and transfer all, all around the world. Um, and I think that's going to sadly decline. Um, and without real investment, um, yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't see anything other than um, trouble ahead with that, really. And as you say, you know, places like the Opera House and the national, the, you know, they're not, they're not able to take the risk that they used to take and, you know, w watching some of the programming at the national at the moment, it's like, there's some very strange choices, but, I, you know, I don't know how, yeah, I, do, I, do, I don't know, really, <laughs> it's, it's really sad, but, um, you know, there, there should, you know, London is, is full of sort of interesting dynamic theatre or, or was. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know what the answer to that is, I'm afraid. Sorry. Hi. Um, I'm interested, in, as you say that you, uh, you, you, uh, you say that you don't, uh, don't like cameras in theatre, what, what was your kind of thought process then um, in then approaching a show with a very, very camera-centric design. Well, that was, that was sort of the point, because I, I realised, you know, there's been a lot of... There's been a lot of shows I've seen, theatre shows, with camera, cameras in it. Um, but this was a chance to do it properly. And we had, you know, 36 Black Magic Ursas, all with custom LUTs that were, we bought in um, uh, some professional, you know, grading people to come and grade directly to screen load all the LUTs on, like, if you're going to do it, this was the way to do it, you know? Like, 
and it wasn't just two cameras revolving around on stage, it was 36 cameras, like, tightly cut, you know, and all called by the DSM, like, it was, um, it was just the, it was the perfect opportunity, I think, and that, that's why I took it on. Um, now, whether it was successful or not, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and I think that, probably, to be honest, I, I thought there, there might have been a bigger idea behind it, but um, I'm not sure there was, actually, <laughs> after, after going through all of that. But it, 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 it was interesting, you know, and I, I think there should be more experimentation like that. But just throwing cameras into a theatre production, you know, I can see why you have it in a, in a large arena show. But that's why, that's why I wanted to talk through that idea of, like, getting in the way of the connection with, with your talent on stage. Um, because I'm, I'm still unsure, even having finished that show, whether I helped or hindered, you know? So, but yeah, that's why I took it on, really. I was like, you know what? It just felt like a golden opportunity. And it really was, it was a visceral, interesting show, you know? And a lot of the people that were lucky enough to see it, you know, I've had a lot of really good feedback from. Um, it's just a shame that more people couldn't get to see it. Have you ever been asked to design a show where you thought it didn't warrant any sort of video or projection, and how did you? Absolutely, to yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's been a couple of shows. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just to shut up and like turn it all off. And I think that that's always one of the one of the great things about like certainly the theatre community and the sort of team of theatre designers is that you know um, some of the best lighting designers I've ever worked with are the ones that know when to turn everything off, you know. It's, and it's the same with video, it's just, uh, there have been plenty of shows where actually we've realized halfway through the rehearsal process that actually it's not needed and we just have to sort of pull it all out. Um, and that's always a very difficult decision because you, you want to feel like you're doing your job, but you are doing your job by actually pulling it away. But yeah, it's, it's happened a few times. There was uh, the, Benedict Cumberbatch Hamlet, who did at the Barbican a few years ago, which has the most projectors I've ever put into a theatre show, with, which pretty much we don't open the shutters on. Um, but yeah, there we go. I was still part of the design team and, you know, still get royalties. So it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a, a quick one more on a kind of personal something I'm interested in, Luke. So, because um, you're talking about designing for an audience, and we just talked about the, the funding cuts and what that means for theatre. Yeah. But I guess like you're well placed to talk maybe about how your process differs or does it differ for the explosion in the immersive experience economy. So you've done Frameless. The way that younger generations want to be entertained is through immersive experience or something they can interact with. And I guess yeah. traditional theatre is more passive and opera. Yeah. Uh, how does your process differ? between those two um, creative processes? Yeah, I mean, that's a whole different p type of audience that I didn't really get into um, uh, of immersive theatre. And obviously, you know, those are, those are huge things, and they're huge money makers. Like, you know, even, even things like um, Frameless, the new gallery space, a lot of those sort of bigger touring projection artworks, they generate so much money. It's incredible. People, there is such an appetite for those kind of things. Um, and again, now I, th I think you're seeing producers that are actually willing to throw some more money behind, because they've been successful, so successful, they're willing to actually help develop that as an art form. Um, and certainly a lot of the immersive shows that are, um, are sort of coming around now, you know, pe people love them, you know, and they, they, you know. Ultimately for me, I, and as a video designer, it's, the reason I haven't, I've sort of stepped away from a lot of immersive experiences is because they're interpreting someone else's IP in a way. And so it doesn't, as a designer, it doesn't necessarily interest me. Um, but certainly I think it's an absolute valid part of the landscape of, of how the industry can generate money and, um, you know, where you, you can work on those shows and make a decent amount of money and then maybe, you know, develop something else, you know, or do something that is a little bit more of a passion project. So, you know, I think, I think they're great. I have a kind of follow-on question to mm. that. Um, is, 
the way you think about a seated audience different to how you're thinking about the visuals in an audience that's mobile? Yeah, absolutely, because um, you know, one of the biggest things and one of the biggest problems you have with you know, um, pros, proscenium theatre is sight lines, you know, like, and trying to, you know, there's a, there's a seat, sweet spot where you have to design everything so everyone can actually see it. Uh, whereas if you're designing an immersive space, you can encourage people to take a different viewpoint. You can hide things from people and encourage them to go and find it in a way that you just can't in a, with a seated audience. You know, like you have to, you have to make sure, you know, if it's, if, it's a, if it's a big story point, you have to make sure that everyone can see it because otherwise, you know, otherwise they, you know, they're not going to be able to follow along and it's really unfair. Um, and trying to design stuff which works for the gods as well as the stalls is really, really hard, actually. Um, and it's, it, I find that quite difficult because it's hard not to be really elitist about, you know, there's a reason the stalls seats are so much more expensive. But I really do try and make sure that we, you know, I view things from, you know, all heights and try and give everyone a, you know, if it, even if it's not the same experience, at least a valid experience. Yeah, they're two very different things. On the back there. Uh, I'm curious to hear if you've had some experience with, um, uh, if you've had some experience between scripted and um, pre-planned events like West Side Story, as you were showing there, um, versus interpreting live. Um, I, my first thought is uh, the actual play community online of. Yeah playing mostly Dungeons and Dragons, but with performers and, and, and improvisers um, live or... So more like devised theatre, you mean? Or? Yeah, a little bit like yeah, that. Yeah, um, yeah so, okay, so there's, there's, there's two things there, sort of reacting to something live. Um, and that's not something I have much experience with. Um, to be honest, but I've devised theatre I do. So devised theatre is where you basically, instead of sort of taking all of your uh, actors into a rehearsal room with no technology um, and with a script and just figuring it through, it's actually sort of figuring the script out as you work through the piece. So as you're phys figuring out the physicality of it, you're also figuring out the script and also you can bring in all the technology into that space as well. So that then becomes part of the palette of the show. And uh, I've worked on a couple of shows, where, although it's a huge time expense, you know, you're in the rehearsal room for, you know, four or five months, you can develop some really amazing uses of technology where you're giving these actors just, you know, you've just got a couple of cameras or some projection or, you know, some screens. And it's amazing when you show people these devices, these storytelling devices, it's amazing what can happen when you get a group of actors around that stuff and you create these absolutely magical moments that, that none of us would be able to come up with on our own. Like, there's just something about how the, the way actors and the way performers like, interact with things and the, the, almost their naivety around it, which can create these really amazing experiences. Um, and I'd hazard a guess that that actually that serendipity can sort of be translated into the, you know, the, the, the improvised world as well. Great. I think we have some questions from the live stream. Oh, great. Um, Amanda from the live stream says, can you elaborate more on slow design? Uh, <laughs> and have you managed to find this is possible with ever decreasing budget slash time constraints? Um, so, slow design. Uh, well, I think it involves a bit more planning. Uh, it involves you having to nail your colors to the mast, literally. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing, really. I, you know, I don't think that there is often many good decisions that are made at the last minute under a lot of pressure, I suppose. And giving clients, directors, 
the ability to change anything means that they will change everything. And within that process, something gets lost, I think. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I just, I'm not, I'm not sure that people under a lot of pressure, time-wise, or you know. So as I, I always try to explain to um, theatre people about rock and roll or touring and that kind of thing, it's like imagine putting the actors in charge, and, then, <laughs> <laughs> and it just doesn't make any sense. You know, these are the people that are on stage; they're the most stressed out. They can't even view what's going on, and they're the ones telling you what to do and what they want to change. It just doesn't doesn't make any sense, and it's about. Therefore, then it's about creating a relationship with an artist. So like, for example, Pet Shop Boys, who I've been designing their shows for the last 10 years or so, there's a huge amount of trust there. And they pretty much let me get on with it. They will, they will say, oh, I don't like that. Or you know, they'll say little bits and pieces, but pretty much they'll let me get on with it. And I think developing those relationships is, is much more important. But that's because I'm, I'm sort of looking at my practice as as a design practice rather than a service provision. Um, and I suppose that's, that's the difference, really. And that's how I probably get away with a bit more slow design. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, thanks.